گش برد خوین ادی قلم گش چون اجور گچ بنر چر خاجی هان زور گرید آنم مر زور چن چون پش برد خوین ادی قلم گش چون اجور گچ م تو غازن به مر وار شوره دلو م تو غازن به مر وار جنگه گچ م تو غازن به مر وار شوره دلو م تو غازن Nuira Kespir, nom de guerre Sozdar, called everything from undesirable alien to dangerous terrorist by the governments of the world, exists in an incomprehensible legal gray zone following her release from a Dutch prison. And tonight she sits as the only woman at the table in the home of some of her most ardent supporters. The other women are in the same house, and they are part of the women's movement just like Sozdar, Yet they segregate themselves by eating in the living room, while the men engage in lively chatter at the table. Sozdar has joined the men at the table, but she is staring blankly into space, tuning out the clanking of glass dishes around her, lost in a whirlwind of thoughts. It is impossible to know exactly what she is thinking about, but it could quite possibly be the very ironic fact that while she has spent almost every free day. Lecturing Kurdish women about breaking the mental self-perpetuation of their own oppression, here those same women are seating the table to the men and doing all the cooking, serving, waiting, and washing. Presumably, the men consider themselves adherents to the Kurdish freedom movement's women's liberationist politics too, since they campaigned to free the notorious female guerrilla leader from prison and are now taking part in an underground railroad that shuffles her from safe house to safe house. Preventing her rearrest as a stateless person to belonging to no legal nation, yet in the supposedly friendly house, everyone but her carries on their role in the five thousand year old drama of patriarchal domination that they rail against in public. Surely, Sozdar's inward dialogue is compounded by the fact that she has been stuck in Europe for three years since a routine September two thousand one diplomatic trip as a PKK mouthpiece. Under a fake identity, turned into an unexpected post-9/11 horror story. We can imagine her still sitting there in a daze, her mind in the mountains, oblivious that the general swing of the evening is moving from the kitchen to the living room. Sozdar, now fully re-emerged in the present moment, responds to an overheard question about the news and stands by the TV, fiddling with the volume. Behind her, the four men sit sprawled out on the couch while the women flock to the coffee table. Setting a glass of chai, ever present in Kurdish households, in front of each of them, Sozdar takes a place on the couch, her arms folded and legs crossed, listening and smiling along to the conversation now filling the air. With everyone served, the remaining three women pull up the wooden chairs from the kitchen table and sit down around the half circle that is completed by the TV. The volume of the news is barely perceptible, and the room's interest has been occupied by the conversation at hand. Seemingly. One of the men noticed some sort of hesitancy with the three women sitting opposite him, and asks, "What's your problem, ladies?" The conversation carries on in Dutch, and an amused woman, her streaked blonde hair tied back in a loose ponytail splitting at her shoulders, fires back that the problems are not just with the ladies, but problems between men and women. The tone of her words is jovial but emphatic. A male voice questions, "Like what?" While another chimes in lightly. Men never cause problems; only women, prompting full-throated laughter from the men. Sozdar remains quiet, taking it all in. The Kurdish women's movement. The women's liberation struggle in Kurdistan is probably the most developed and successful aspect of the Kurdish freedom movement, more generally, and the Rojava revolution, more specifically. But it hasn't always been this way. Like in most revolutionary movements, the men of the PKK were initially very guarded of patriarchal norms. 
It is often the case with oppressed men that they feel a sense of powerlessness due to the way the state and other dominant structures strip their culture, economic means, and political autonomy from them, so to regain a semblance of that power, they exert control over women who are doubly oppressed. It is likely that, like most socialist revolutionaries, the men of the PKK in the early days of the party would have generally claimed to support women's freedom. But theory doesn't always make practice, and women's issues were originally put on hold by most male party members. The situation at the beginning and massive transformation of the party on the issue is best told by the women who lived it themselves. Here are the contexts from longtime revolutionary Zilan Diyar writing for Commune Academy is crucial. Here are her words. From the very beginning, since the group that later formed the PKK came together, women were among those attracted to and curious about revolution. However, it is possible to say that national liberation and class struggle were the primary motivations at the time. Not freedom, but equality were the priorities. Of course, this notion of equality is one that was determined by patriarchal structures and mentalities. For this reason, women's existence and successes in the revolution were determined by the standards and measures of men. Lifting heavy items like men, fighting like men, walking like men. What I am trying to say is that we experience the same obstacles and shortcomings of all other Marxist theory-inspired struggles. But this did not last as long in our case. Zilan recounts that the start of the armed struggle brought many women to the mountains of Kurdistan. To quote her some more, In a sphere of male privilege, woman was saying, I too exist. Women in Kurdistan thus rejected their social status. The woman, who was constantly put on reserve by men, was trying to assert her being. This was met by resistance and backlash, because the Kurdish man was content with this privileged position in society. Therefore, women's quest for freedom often did not transgress the frameworks of patriarchy and remained limited to demanding rights." Unquote. Interestingly, Kurdish women in the movement usually give great credit to PKK leader Abdullah Öcalan for being a longtime advocate for not only their increased participation, but their autonomy and centrality in the movement's organization and presentation to the outside world. He increasingly began to put women's liberation at the forefront of his analysis. But it seems that his affinity for women's struggle was greatly influenced by the internal work of the only woman co-founder of the PKK, Sakina Jansis, also known as Sarah. In a documentary about her, Sarah, My Whole Life Was a Struggle, we can see the way Ojalan admired her. <laughs> To be honest, I cannot even do 1% of the things that Sara did. Did I work less? No. For me, it is not like that. But if I compare my efforts with yours, it is nothing. Kurdish women formed their first major women's structure since the beginning of the armed struggle in 1987, the Union of Patriotic Women in Kurdistan, YJWK which, according to Zilan, created and cultivated the consciousness needed to declare women's autonomous units in the PKK's arm-winged in 1992. She argues that, This decision, taken at the end of 1993, led to women asserting their presence in all spheres where they had previously been pushed to the back, in the war, in ideological leadership, in administration, and in education. These steps illustrated women's potential and power. Here's Sozdara Vesta, a.k.a. New Year Kaspir, from our opening narrative. In 1995, the first Congress of Women's Movement was held. Sara and her comrades prepared the political program and statute of the Women's Movement. The Congress was held in a cave in Beshele village in Metina. Sakina Karochan was also there. At that meeting, we were together with Sarah. Was there bigger happiness than this? 300 women were guarding at the mountains, while 300 more at the Congress. This was very emotional for our friend Sarah. Sozdar is sitting next to two Hevalan, meaning friends or comrades. Zaho Zagros and Alif Ronahi join her under the shade of a mountain tree in tall, sunlit grasses. All three are in their PKK guerrilla fighter fatigues, olive drab versions of traditional Kurdish clothing, baggy pants, cargo jacket, and tennis shoes. 
Hevala Zaho. Ojalan sent a political report to the Congress. The main thing from that report in my mind was, how should we live? From her office, Sakina Karakchon adds, Sara was impressed with the level of debate of the delegates. She held my hand and said, could you imagine bringing even five to six women together? But now they are all educated and can discuss very well. Back in the mountains, Havala Runahi chimes in. The Congress was the peak point of the armed women's movement to be able to elect representatives by themselves, promotion of the women commanders, to open their own education center of YAJK were among the decisions of that first Congress. Havala Karakchon. We were not expecting that so many great things for the women's movement would happen in such a short amount of time. But when it happened, we were very happy. Finally, Havala Zakh. The first Congress of Kurdistan Free Women's Union, YAJK, was one of the greatest steps for freedom. Persistent internal struggles from women within the movement had shaped Ojalan's consciousness deeply by the time leading up to his arrest in 1999. Upon being imprisoned, he decided to write his own defense of his actions and to do so trace back the history of oppression to its very beginnings in human history in order to situate the Kurdish freedom movement's role in overcoming that oppression. It was in this defense and subsequent books written from history that Ojalan wrote that all oppression started with the oppression of women and the destruction of Neolithic matricentric cultures and that women were the first colony. As Ojalan saw it, Oppression must be fought first at its source, and so the women's freedom struggle became the most central point of what he saw as the future of the Kurdish movement and the worldwide movement for freedom. His manifesto, Liberating Life, Women's Revolution, argued for the need to kill the dominant male inside of our head to liberate both women and men. It is up to men to change their mentality. These writings also laid the groundwork for genealogy, or the science of women in free life, which has been thoroughly developed by the Kurdish women's movement and is now taught in all schools in Rojava to both women and men. Zilan Diyar states that the scientific research into the history and essence of women is aimed at three goals. Firstly, to expose the history of women's colonization. Secondly, to secure women's freedom. And thirdly, to reach a women's social contract for free life. How have women in Kurdistan gone about these three goals? They have done a great deal of archaeological research into the evidence of women's role in economy in the past. Many ancient women figurines have been found at sites like Tal Halaf, suggesting matricentic cultures where women were highly valued and seen as the sources of life were common in the Neolithic Middle East. They have formed democratic autonomous women's organizations like Krangreya Star in Rojava, with the sole authority to mediate and bring to justice cases in society that deal with patriarchal violence. They have opened their own academies and trained women throughout Rojava who teach all men and women involved with societal structures on genealogy. Anytime people meet to make binding decisions, whether in a commune or a council or a committee meeting, at least 40% of the attendees have to be women in order for there to be quorum. And all sectors of the movement have adopted the co-chair system. For any position of influence, there has to be two people, one woman and one man. Women average 50 to 70% participation in the communes, and through these communes, they have begun to create many women-only cooperatives. Autonomous women's cooperatives also make up a growing sector of Rojava's economy, with a new market solely for women's democratically run businesses to sell their wares being announced on the same day I wrote this. Women have their own defense forces and local security at all levels of the Kurdish movement, and this has even influenced the formation of Arab and Assyriac autonomous women's militias. In Rojava, a woman fighter never takes an order from a man. There are women's houses in almost every neighborhood where women are giving refuge against domestic violence and can find many other tools to meet their needs. There is even Genoir, 
the first women's only village that serves especially widows and divorcees, but also women who just want increased autonomy and support. There are just a few examples, and I go much more in depth in my video, Women's Committee, Backbone of the Rojava Revolution. It is important to stress an important difference in male-female relations in the PKK that separates them from the Black Panther Party and really any other political organization that Western audiences can relate to. When people join the PKK guerrillas, they take a vow of celibacy and to stay unmarried as long as they are in the organization. In the YPG and YPJ, this is not as much of a requirement because of their nature as a conventional force drawing from much larger sections of society and protecting more defined territory than the PKK guerrillas in the mountains. But it is still an important ideological underpinning of the whole Kurdish movement. Part of the reason for this is to eliminate distraction from the work at hand, but the guerrillas are also attempting to find new healthy ways of women and men relating to one another. They advocate what they call Hevjiana Azad, or free co-life. The PKK's discouragement of marriage is based on the need for the transformation of the male mindset in a new definition of masculinity that abandons any notion of ownership in relation to women. Until that mental shift, and Ojalan includes himself in this, the institution of marriage is seen as oppressive. Ojalan sums up the movement's discourse on such male-female relationships beyond sexuality in his pamphlet Democratic Autonomy. Capitalist modernity is a system based on the denial of love. The denial of society, the uncontrollability of individualism, pervasive sexism, the deification of money, the substitution of nation-state for God, and the transformation of women into unwaged or low-paid workers also mean denial of the material basis of love. To approach a woman's sexuality solely by finding her biologically attractive, and to relate to her on this basis, is the loss of love from the very beginning. Just as we don't call the biological mating of other species love, we cannot call biologically based sexual intercourse between humans love either. We can call this the normal breeding activity of living beings. There is no need to be human to conduct these activities. Those who want true love have to abandon this animal-human type of reproduction. We can see women as valuable friends and comrades only to the extent that we transcend viewing them as objects of sexual appeal. The most difficult relationship is one of friendship and camaraderie with a woman that transcends sexism. These new relationships based on friendship and camaraderie are a major exploration in the current Kurdish women's movement. While the knee-jerk response from Western audiences may be to deem such activities towards sex and relationships as repressive, it is important to keep in mind that sexual assault and boundary violation is far too frequent in American leftist circles and many liberation-minded organizations have been torn apart at the seams due to romantic or sexual relationships between activists and organizers and the jealousy, drama, and hurt feelings they often bring to the fore. In understanding the movement's approach towards sex and relationships, it is crucial to situate that approach in the broader context of the influence of patriarchal culture, the nature of the work done by the fighters, and the other activities and focuses of the women's movement. Between two worlds I 
do belong My father was rich and white He forced my mother late one night What do they call me? The Black Women's Movement The Black Panther Party was initially strongly steeped in macho revolutionary rhetoric that was very prevalent at the time in groups that distinctly emphasized militant physical resistance against oppression. The organization started out as only men, and their image radiated the idea that black men were restoring their masculinity by picking up the gun and protecting their community. But the macho imagery hid the rising reality that a huge number of women joined the group quite quickly and eventually became the majority of the party membership, up to 60% at their height. Party newspapers and internal chatter made it quite clear that the expected public image of women in the party was mostly symbolic, even as women were soon doing most of the -the on-the-ground organizing. The expectations of the early male leadership were similar to those of the Iraqi Kurdish military forces, the Peshmerga, whom in the fight against the Islamic State beginning around 2014, strategically used photos of women fighters to appeal to Western audiences, while in reality, the Peshmerga women were mostly kept far from the front lines. This is in stark contrast to the Kurdish, Arab, and Syriac units of the YPJ and HSNB in northern Syria, all women's units that don't take orders from men and actively engage in frontline combat. But just as the women of the Kurdish PKK had to launch a sort of internal revolution to gain the participation, respect, and autonomy they deserved, so too did the women of the Panthers. Their work led to the Panthers officially declaring sexism counter-revolutionary and taking much more active stances through their newspaper on women's issues, including reproductive rights. The Panthers organized community child care and education programs that helped communalize some of the tasks of child rearing so that more women could actively participate in the party. Coming back once again to vanguard of the revolution, we can hear a letter written to Huey P. Newton from one of the women of the party. 
Then Claiborne Carson, a historian providing some context as to the size of women's participation, part of a speech by Kathleen Cleaver, and some reflections by Elaine Brown. Dear Huey, when I joined the party, I was thrilled about becoming part of an organization that believes in the equality of men and women. It bothers me that there are brothers who still view women as sexual objects. We should have no men in the Black Panther Party who feel this way, or women for that matter. One of the ironies of the Black Panther Party is that the image is the black male with the jacket and the gun, but the reality is the majority of the rank and file at, at, by the end of the 60s are women. Everybody knows that all the people don't have liberties, all the people don't have freedom, all the people don't have justice, and all the people don't have power, so that means none of us do. The Black Panther Party certainly had a chauvinist tone, and so we tried to change some of the clear gender roles so that women had guns and men cooked breakfast for children. Did we overcome it? Of course we didn't. As I like to say, we didn't get these brothers from revolutionary heaven. Angela Davis, Elaine Brown, and Kathleen Cleaver were the most notable women Panthers, and they now have some of the most staying power in our memories of the Black Panther Party and of the valuable work that persisted even after the party's demise. The Black Panther, the official party newspaper and the way that most people grappled with the concrete ideas of the Panthers, was fully edited by women from 1968 until its folding in 1982. Yet despite the official party stances and men taking more care roles than before, sexism continued to be a problem until the end. The hyper-masculine attitude and even cult of personality surrounding Huey P. Newton and other male leaders had especially dangerous repercussions for women. In an interesting parallel to the Kurdish movement, Abdullah Ojalan also received almost mythic status that was very common for authoritative male leaders at the time. But perhaps miraculously, he was able to use that influence to call for shifting the foremost focus of the movement towards women's freedom and autonomy, while also calling for the complete decentralization of power and the rejection of hierarchy. This public disavowal of all the factors that give him privilege and secure his power is a very rare trait for any leader, and something that Huey did not have. The combination of Huey's attachment to power, his failure to adequately combat patriarchy's influence in his personality, and his substance abuse problems led to a common spiral into paranoia and violence among leaders who find their control waning. His abusive personality led many of the longest-running party members to leave, including Erica Huggins. Even Bobby Seale, his co-founder, left during Huey's spiral in the 1970s. Elaine Brown, who had risen to chairwoman of the party when Huey was exiled, finally quit in 1977. The final straw for her was when Huey had Regina Davis, the administrator of Oakland Community School, severely beaten for reprimanding a male colleague. In her words, the beating of Regina would be taken as a clear signal that the words panther and comrade had taken on a gender connotation, denoting the inferiority in the female half of us. As she says in this audio clip, Erica Huggins also left because of Huey. You can hear excerpts from just a few of the letters written by women to Huey P. Newton, in which they state their desire to leave the party due to pervasive sexism. Elaine Brown tops off the clip by explaining her mindset upon leaving the party. Then there was a time when he was violent with me. And that was why I left the Black Panther Party. I said goodbye as I left, but I left. Dear Huey, I've been in the party for nine and a half years but I've come to a crossroads in my life. One path is the party, and the other path is my personal happiness. I know you're busy, but I see our party falling apart, and nothing is being done to stop this from happening. It was absolutely devastating for me to leave the Black Panther Party. I felt guilty that I hadn't 
um, you know, stayed to do something. I wasn't sure what. There was no other life. There was no other thing greater. The problems of patriarchy in the Black Panther Party sadly did not end with Huey P. Newton. Ultimately, there was a major distinction between ideas on paper and actual practice when it came to women's status in the organization. The onus in 1960s and 70s American for much of the left was that revolution was against racism and capitalism. Gender issues would have to wait until after the revolution. While certainly not the only factor in the undoing of the Panthers, their failure to go far enough on the issue of women's liberation was one of the most major. It is true that the Kurdish movement also started with gender on the back burner. It took time and inner struggle from the women in the movement to bring it to the fore. Maybe if the Black Panthers had survived the harsh repression early on with more pieces intact, more resilient, they would have come around to the level that the PKK has with time. But if they had made women's liberation a priority from the beginning, with less vision points for COINTELPRO to exploit, maybe they would have been more resilient through the repression of the state. The Panthers were also a product of a time, and place, and the centralized hierarchical and macho culture of the American left shaped them on a course that was hard to break. But to the extent that the party did have successes towards women's liberation, it was due to the willingness of so many black women to join the movement and challenge sexism within the party. Thanks for listening to episode 4 of Panthers and Gorillas, Free Woman, Free Society. I'm Ian Campbell, aka Neighbor Democracy. We opened up this episode with the song Ketcha Kurdan, or Kurdish Girl, by Ainur Doan. In the interlude, you heard Four Women by Nina Simone, the legendary black singer-songwriter. And you are now hearing Rojbin performing Jinjian Azadi, a song titled after the slogan of the Kurdish women's movement that means Women, Life, Freedom. See you next Wednesday for our fifth episode, A Change Is Gonna Come. Yeah.